We are in Joshua Tree. Oh, fantastic. National National Park. It's beautiful here. It's my first time here. It is beautiful here. I may I'm I'm taking you to a lot of places for the first time. That That's in be. the contract. Yeah, that is in the contract. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a stupid thing to say when when it's like, oh, well, let's just say Emily hasn't. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> she hasn't gone to a lot of places, and now she's going all just berserk all over the world, and she's having a great time with me, and I, as I am with you. So, so this is kind of a rest day, if you will, even though we're doing a podcast. We just wrapped up an insane, and I mean insane, three-day workshop at the Salton Sea which was mind blowing. It was wild. It was an advanced creative lighting workshop. Yeah, it's the first time, you know, I've been doing workshops for years and all of my workshops have typically been, you know, either editing workshops, four day boot camps, um, portraiture, that kind of stuff. I've even done landscape workshops in the past. Mm. But um started off on this one and uh I, I did it really at a as a result of a customer requests. People are like, Hey, we love your regular workshops We've done two or three. We want something more advanced. So I created this workshop series that uh, we kicked off just the last this last weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the Salton Sea. And uh, it was it was pretty intense. Very, very intense. Yeah, you definitely covered aspects that are not included in the regular portraiture workshops. No doubt. Um, this is pulling out all the toys, pulling out, you know, all the stops, throwing all the bells and whistles into it and showing, you know, the people what what we really can do and what, what photographers should be able mm-hmm. to do in the world of photography. Um, as many of you know, listening to this, as I'm sure Emily knows, photography's, you know, it's a Greek term for photography is painting with light. Your ability to draw with light, your ability to create and shape and mold and define light. You know, we had seven attendees at this one and and I think four of them were return workshop attendees. You know, when we did the intros and talked about the workshop and kind of laid out the the game plan for what we're going to do, what was very interesting was, you know, they were very curious what's going to be different and what can we look forward to. And, and I kind of relayed a, a message to them that I think is, is pertinent for the photography industry and in that in this day and age, with the increases in innovation and technology, the barrier to entry and why the market is so saturated um the barrier to entry as a photographer is next to nothing now and you can go from because of the dynamic range that cameras possess because of the intense uh focus mechanisms that exist within cameras now that currently or just even when i started back in the archaic days of you know a decade ago it it was exponentially more difficult to focus to light we didn't have high-speed sync we didn't have LED lighting. We didn't have LED flash. It was really uh, quite a different era. And I know photographers listening to this, if you're an old timer, you may be saying, damn, Jason, you're talking 10 years ago. How about 30 years ago? And I guess what I'm here to say is it's insane how much the industry has changed. And, uh, you know, I was sharing a story about with the workshop group about watching Joe McNally videos of him out in the Sahara Desert. And for those who don't know, Joe Manali is a great photographer and Nikon guy. But at the time, he was having to go out and uh, get, I don't know, 8, 9, 10, 12, whatever ridiculous amount of speed lights set up on pocket wizards um, to just be able to fire on camera or on location flash. And that was even before he had to do that, you know, without the advantages of high speed sync, meaning he had to fire at a normal sync speed of two fiftieth of a second or slower. And as a result, it means you can't shoot at wide apertures and whatever else. And so it was really crazy because just going from those days of when I first started to now we're spoiled to death because we have monolights, 600 watt second monolights that we can just set up. It's all well and self-contained unit. It's not the days of us pulling out and dragging freaking car batteries, Mm. putting them on the desert ground, worrying about salt, worrying about connections, worrying about all of these things we used to have to worry about in the world of photography. The bottom line out of all of that little uh, diatribe is it is incredibly easy to become you, you start off a photographer, if the scale is 1 to 10, you start off at a 1, you can very quickly, within the matter of, honestly, a year, you can get to a 7. And my contention is that 
that is where the vast majority of the photography community sits. They're at about sixes or sevens. And the reason they don't progress and they plateau is simply because they do not put in the effort to learn all of these additional things about photography that are, that are vital to your growth and to your success. Um, I mean, as a, as a newer photographer, how, do, how does that how does that strike you, Emily, to, to, to listen to that? And do you, do you find it to be something that is intimidating to you? Are you excited? Are you excited to take this challenge with me? I mean, what, what are your thoughts? So I can completely agree with um, the fact that it's easy to become a seven because technology now makes it, makes it simple to do so. Like the mirrorless cameras, the great focus systems, just as you described, like it's not, it, it's not too difficult to be able to take a, a really nice image, but to be able to go past that point of being a seven and to push through that and keep pushing yourself, that, that definitely requires some work. Um, and I love being able to play with all the lights with you and, and learn that <laughs> because I before before I started working with you, um, you know, I moved to Oregon and I was away from my my friends who I would like comfortably photograph and learn with back home in New York. And I found myself like plateauing. So it's just I think that you teaching this like advanced creative lighting workshop um, really will benefit a lot of those uh, photographers out there who are just sitting at that seven and need the extra push to uh, to learn some more and, and break out of break out of their comfort zone. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've said to people many times is that my biggest fear as a newer photographer was having somebody like you come to me, give me a request for whatever kind of a shot, and me just saying, well, I just don't know how to do that. So you make up whatever right. excuse. That's not my artistic vision. It's not <laughs> what I want to do. Technically, I've heard photographers flat out i've watched them do it i've uh, marco polo this is joshua tree someone's screaming at each other but uh but yeah I, i've watched photographers flat out lie to clients just because they're like oh that's just not the right thing to do when the truth is it's like eh, you just don't know how to do it right 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 and i believe a great photographer is like a great chef i as she'll tell you i just love analogies <laughs> and a great chef a great chef man you throw a chef into a kitchen you say well you got you got peanut butter, you got this, you got that, you've got some noodles, you've got whatever, some crazy random things. Make a dish. They would make it. It may it may not be ideal. It may not be whatever that they would prefer, but they could make it work. Likewise, if you put a great chef in a kitchen and you gave him or her all of the ingredients, that great chef, in my opinion... You know, if we went to dinner and we're like, hey, let's make, we want you to make us this. Oh, now we want you to make us that. Oh, now we want you to make us this. And now we want you to make that. A great chef, should, no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. They should be able to do that. And the same as a great photographer. Um, you know, if you're a business, if you're out there and you have clients, you should feel comfortable shooting a reception at a wedding or shooting at noon in the afternoon. Like, you know, you got to figure out how to balance and work with all of those conditions given to you. Yeah, I got to say this. One of the things that drove me crazy when I was a newer photographer um, is I would I attended two or three workshops and those those traumatized me because what I found going to those workshops were those photographers set up the entire thing to minimize the amount of effort they would have to put in and pull in off that workshop. And they set it up to where it's a guarantee that the attendees are going to get great shots. Right. And what learning, how much learning are they doing if it's all set up for you? Right. And I remember I went to one workshop in particular where uh, we went in there and there was four or five different rooms. It was a mansion in Atlanta. I flew all the way out there. I was a new photographer. I was super excited for it. Went all the way out there and four or five different models in different bedrooms. And uh, I quickly realized that it was not the kind of workshop that I thought it was going to be where there was going to be a, maximiz a maximizing of a learning experience. And what it was is a bunch of doctors and dentists who wanted to take pictures of pretty girls. And I'm like, dude, I mean, I'm not going to say the instructor's name. He is a well-known photographer. But I went in and I'm like, can you show me how to use this flash? Oh, man, literally, guys, the, the settings were on the wall. You put a transmitter on the top of your camera. The light was already set up to match those settings. The girls would pose for you, and then you would just take pictures. 
And I'm like, I'm not learning anything. So I guess what Emily just said is very important. I mean, what, what we did yet the last couple of days is, um, and just, just follow me on this. This isn't pitching the workshop. This is talking to you about how to light for those listening and watching. What you what's what most of us in the world of photography, we always talk about magic hour. We always talk about how magic hour is the only hour that we should shoot or overpowering the sun or whatever else it is. Those are you guys gotta understand, those are elementary levels of photography. We're talking that's third, fourth grade, maybe. <laughs> Once you've got high speed sync flash down and you think you're cooking with coconut oil and you're just <laughs> flying off to the races. And believe me, I watch it. I watch it online. I watch the guys who are like, damn, I'm mother freaking good. And then they'll get a they'll get a camera, they'll put it wide open, they'll pop that 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 shutter speed up to eight thousandths of a second, they'll put their aperture wide open so they can shoot anywhere. They get a sexy hot chick, they just set her up, and then they're like, damn, I'm good, and they're firing a Godox flash or whatever. My response would be, okay, that's cool. What else? What's next? What's your follow-up? That's just my style. <laughs> no, 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 that's not your style. That's all you know how to do. And for those listening, if, that, if you fall into that category, don't be offended by that. Take my challenge to be more. Take my challenge to be more. And realize that that is what makes you valuable not what everyone else is doing guys that is a that is a small tool in my toolkit with that what i just described yes i've done that but that is such a small tool in my toolkit and so what you got to realize it was funny we're at the salton sea very harsh conditions in the middle of the desert and i kept saying to emily man i need more harsh light i need more harsh light <laughs> right and it's because we set up a 12 by 12 diffuser that they use for hollywood and the harsher the light is coming through that, the softer the light is once it's it... It's like this beautiful glow it's, coming down. It's surreal. Even even standing, watching it with your bare eyes, forget about the camera. Watching it with your eyes, you can just see how magical it is. And I think that's what I want to really convey to photographers is understand that great light, great conditions exist anywhere. You just have to know how to bring them out. And what's so cool about the lighting workshop is you targeted just about every lighting condition that there is, you know, from 10 a.m. until 7 p.m. And it was so cool to watch you go through the whole process. And not only did you allow the attendees to shoot during all of those circumstances, you taught them how to uh, set up all the modification and, and play with different equipment that they may feel apprehensive or nervous to use by themselves. So giving them a taste and teaching them how to like set all that stuff up, I think that's so valuable. So it's like not only are they shooting their their hands on uh, setting it up so they can do it when they go home. Thank you. One thing that I've always tried to do with my videos and I do with the workshops is I actually try to make it difficult because that's, that's how I taught myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is easy. Like right now we're in very flat light. Make what difficult? The, the shooting scenario? I try to make my process as streamlined as possible, but I take the challenge of, I've already done that. Let me try something else. Let me oh, try something okay, new. okay, okay. Right. I'm glad you clarified that. But yeah, it's, for example, the workshop, let's, let's go into a difficult scenario. Let's not, let's, hey, let's set the workshop yeah, at 4 o'clock. how are you going to learn if you're just doing everything that you're comfortable with? Well, on top of that, it's like, hey, let's start the workshop. At, let's let's shoot indoors, and then when it gets close to magic hour, oh, now we're going to go, go outside. outside. Yeah, yeah, give yeah, me a yeah. break. <laughs> That's not the reality of photography. You could be in a many in many different scenarios where your client needs you to do something else. With that diffuser, I was waiting for noon. You ain't kidding. And that's what like, we did. Yeah, let's get out there. And on, on the first day of the workshop, we went inside an abandoned, um, shocker of all shockers, but we went inside of an abandoned warehouse? whatever that was. I don't know what it was. Yeah, some kind Old of a warehouse. Building. But went inside that warehouse and started shooting and just went through one scenario after another and another and another. And it was really cool because it has this beautiful desert landscape in the background. It had an old train. Uh, in the distance on the tracks and mm -hmm. so I purposely set up a shot where we had the had Emily sitting in, inside of the, the the warehouse but then we exposed for the background which is like a painting yeah it looks like a painting pastels mountains this wonderful train 
And then we used flash on, on her, and then we used a kicker light, and then we started adding elements. And I, oh, I, I, I have to bring it up. One of the things that I loved about this workshop that we're doing on this mm. is the styling. Oh, yeah. We yeah. Had, that was a big component of the first day um, because, you know, it's an, an advanced lighting workshop. So you need to light as much as you can and, and consider aspects that will reflect light. So styling plays a huge role in that. You know, what is your subject and th wearing? This, this woman over here is the queen of styling. Thank you. She's ridiculous. Thank you. So um, I brought brought Salzy, our little uh, costume and wardrobe suitcase. Baby. Yep. And she was filled. She put stickers all over the front of Salzy too. And yeah, guys, so if you guys ever come to a workshop and you have cool stickers, let's slap them on Salzy. Yeah, and Salzy, <laughs> we, Salzy's nickname, just a quick little detour. We are in London, or not even London, but we are somewhere in the UK, in Uck. And uh, we went into a Sainsbury's, which is like their version of Walmart. We needed a new suitcase for Emily for, I can't remember why. And so we start pushing Saul uh, this this black suitcase down doing we're doing rolling tests with it in the in the aisles and uh then after we left and got it we're like what's Sainsbury sounds like Salisbury steak so it got the so nickname we brought, of her, brought her home and now she's Salzy and so inside the wardrobe uh or, or you guys inside like Salzy. that you guys like how I'm telling a story and then Emily's like okay Let's get back to this. Let's you get told, back to we business. We talked about this in Oceanside. Did we? Yeah, we did. Oh, well, senility is kicking That's in. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> you got to pretend like, you know, there's always first time listeners out there. You're right about that. There's always first time <laughs> listeners. Did you, you love how she, she just uh, um, Salzy. puts up with <laughs> <laughs> Inside of Salzy had a bucket full of accessories. Um, and so, you know, it's just like costume jewelry or things that make it so we are prepared to shoot everywhere we go. Totally. Um, and one thing I'm going to add to that is yeah. I like to consider myself the MacGyver of photography. And one thing that I've, Emily's adopted the role of is she's the MacGyver of styling. So when she tells you that she has outfits and jewelry and ways to body paint and ways to accessorize and everything within one single rolling suitcase it's no joke she really does yeah and the reason i'm sharing this with you um because you guys can go out and do this too you mm -hmm. know it's a collaboration between you and your subject or you and the model and so my suitcase was not full of items for solely myself i shared it and helped jazz up the other models who were there so if you're out and about I, and you see some costume jewelry and you see some sparkles and glitter or different props a cool basket or bucket or vase or just something that would photograph really really well um, i encourage you to get that and you know, go to secondhand stores. I love Let Go. And, and, and you're just always prepared. So then you can collaborate with your model or with your subject and be able to say, hey, here's some stuff. You know, what can we create together? Like, this is what I have. This is what you have. Let's see what magic we can make. Yeah, you don't, we don't, we're not going to share all of our secrets. Some of them you do have to actually come to a workshop to do. Totally. But let's just say that she gets body painted by um, some flakes and some Mountain Dew. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You got to be quick with it and spontaneous, but at least prepared, at least prepared. So just think that through, you know. Um, well, let, let's talk about that. The, the first night um, when we were shooting inside the, the warehouse. Um, with or without the attendees? Good point. The first night we went there and we shot, we, we pre-shot it the first night and had a, a crazy time. Because I, it's not good to make your clients guinea pigs, my friends. So we were out there before scoping it out and finding all the good spots. Absolutely. There's this really cool stage looking thing. And the really fun part is you can actually, um, it's like compound interest. You know, the more you have, the more it grows. Okay. And cool. so, so compound interest in the world of uh, <laughs> artistic endeavors, you walk into an abandoned place where you've had a very talented artist paint something. And now you get to add on top of that. Love that. And that's what we did the first night. We went in there, and there was this beautiful mural that they had painted, and it, it looked like a stage. Yeah, right it was ends. so dynamic because the teeth were at the the front of the stage. Like, how would you describe the wood that makes up the bottom of the you stage? Know what, you know what it seemed like to me? It was you like know, 3D. You know, you, you watch those old, you watch plays like kids put in school? Yeah. And then they have, like, the, the water come in front or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like that to where when you stood inside of there, 
uh, if you're watching the video cast of this, if not, go to jasonlander.com slash podcast. You'll see pictures from this shoot. It was this big blue thing. It was probably 16 feet wide, and they had painted big, beautiful eyes right in the center, or on the, on the left and right, and then in the center we put Emily. And then sit, and in front of her were like teeth, but it's, it's kind of broken out since it's, you know, abandoned. Mm-hmm. But, and like uh, the, the part that protruded out from the stage, like the base of it. Yeah, it was wild. Because it was all like kicked out. I was kind of standing where a stage would have been. But yeah, it was really cool. So I stood right in the middle of those two eyes and I was a part of the environment. Yeah, it was really cool. And that's something that we talk a lot about. If there's one thing we try to do, it's try to create organic work, meaning like we're sitting here at Joshua Tree. What we would want to do is incorporate aspects of Joshua Tree that are unique to Joshua Tree. And that means adorning her with some of the natural environment it means whether that means she rolls around in the in the sand we use you know of course only stuff that's you know okay to do but use shrubbery vegetation stuff like that stuff that is um, part of the environment mm-hmm. you know let's say let's say there's 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 sticks or shrubs or something that's fallen off of and it's no longer attached to a plant I'd have no problem you know putting that on your outfit and whatever else right you know and making and, that. and we did something very similar in the abandoned building there was like lots of metal and debris all around and oh I you're had, right I had I adorned myself with some I don't know, metal wire. Coil. Yeah, coil. Yeah, I'm dragging coil through the warehouse and say, hey, let's wrap this around you. Yeah, yeah. They found a bed frame and we, that was another part of the shoot. Mm-hmm. Grabbed a bed frame and made it like a, like a. A little wall behind me. It looked cool in the frame. It was just really cool. And then the next night we took the, the group back there. We did a whole session on teaching them. And then we went through and um, I didn't want to use that same stage since we'd done that. Right. So there was this little window looking thing, but it was pushed against the the wall. Yeah, like a like half of a house kind of thing, like a wall of a house. Yeah. There was siding on the inside. Now that you say that, it was crazy. Yeah, very interesting. So I went over there and like a fake little movie set. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I went over there and I pushed against hmm. it and created a space. Um, he's that, he's ripping it off the wall. <laughs> yeah, Emily's so cute. She comes over. She's like, "Let me help you." And I'm like, "No, please step away." <laughs> I, yeah, I said, "If anybody's gonna have stuff fall on them, because we, I really was moving the walls of that place." Yeah. And I'm like, "If anybody's gonna get hurt, I don't want it to be you." And so, uh, I made a good spectator. You did. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent spectator. She gave me the golf the golf clap. But uh, it's almost scary how fast I can tell Emily. Hey, I have an idea, and she's like, oh, "Here we go," and I'm like, "Here," <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "I have an idea. Let's shoot this." So it was really fun because I was we were shooting Cassandra and we we're doing all that, and then and I'm like, "Hey, I'm, uh, we should." I kind of just now I just kind of look at you and you're like, "Okay, we're shooting," and so she's like, "Okay." Um, and I'm readily prepared, so I dive into Salzy and I grab. She grab comes an back. Outfit. She's dressed something like this, just you know. Like normal. Well, she has a clothes. black jean. I remember you had black jeans and black top on. Yeah, yeah. And she comes back with this like this sparkle corset thing with these gold short shorty shorts with a blue tutu. A blue tutu, and all of a sudden she's rocking it on this thing. It's just, like insane, and I'm using like seven lights in the lights. course of like three minutes, and I body painted up real fast. That's what I'm saying. She like she goes <laughs> away and she comes back, and within. Three minutes, two, three minutes, she's completely redressed herself. And not just, we're not just talking close. She changes who she is. It's really, you would have been an excellent chameleon. Thank you. Maybe you know? I was in a past life. Maybe you're a shapeshifter. You know what that is? Yeah. Do you? Siren, shapeshifter, chameleon. <laughs> <laughs> I've had many lives. That's true. <laughs> many That's lives. True. She's been reincarnated. <laughs> but yeah, so we went and, and, and shot that. That turned out fantastic. The next day, was when we went through, and, and um, that's a day where it's really fun. And surprisingly enough, upon because something we do at the end of every workshop was we ask the attendees what they liked the most, and they said they liked day two the most, which day two was me shooting. And the whole purpose of that is I stopped shooting a lot at the workshops. And the reason I stopped doing it is I wanted to make myself available. And the feedback that I was getting after doing that for a little while was, man, we really learn a lot by watching. Yeah, People get really excited and and when you're creating, I can understand why they want to like, you know, shoot behind you and and just 
be able to photograph what's going on however they're they're so into their camera they're not really paying attention to how you're lighting something and why you're doing it and and the the fundamentals behind that so i think that this group was so interested in leaving their cameras like you know letting their cameras uh be out of their hands so they could watch really benefited them and the the most the, the biggest piece to that, they weren't just watching. They were participating. Right. And that's... Right, right, right. Uh, Helping move things, set things up, and th- critically think the scenario through. Yeah, and we're not talking just... We're not talking grunt work, guys. We're talking understanding how the lights work, putting on the modifiers, moving them. Yeah, we stayed at one location from like 11 a.m. until 7 p.m. I just shot and went no breaks. Yeah. It was probably probably once we started shooting five hours of just straight shooting. Yeah, and so think of how drastically, how, how the light changes so much throughout that entire day. Yeah, we went from... You covered everything. Yeah, and that's what was so neat. We went from um, diffuse light, diffuse light with flash, and the flash was... So we had a 12 by 12 diffuser set up on Emily blocking her and this and this huge or not huge but this this shack looking thing so we're blocking a huge amount of space with a 12 by 12 foot two stop diffuser oh yeah it's perfect then we added a flash we went fl- and so now we've diffused her with one light which is cutting bad light then we added the good light and then i triple diffused that with a deflector plate uh, this is on a monolight 600 watt second monolight deflector plate an inner baffle and an outer sock on that on that flash and then we went from there to magic hour lighting. Then magic hour, when the sun started setting, then we started adding the flash back into it to expose for the sunset. Then we went straight in. Then we went into LEDs. Mm-hmm. We went into LED flash, then LED Continu- continuous undiffused, and then LED continuous completely diffused. And then we used like six LEDs, six, seven, eight LEDs. And so... <laughs> well said. It, 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 we, nice job. We, thank you. We really went through and... Um, Showed the group and the feedback that we got, you know, I remember one of the guys, Barry, he's kept saying, he says, to watch you go and instantaneously decide, oh, this, it's like, it's seriously, guys, if you're good at what you do, you look at the light and you're like, oh, this is what I need. This is what I need. Okay, now we got to change. And and she'll tell you when we're shooting, hmm. it's, it's that quick. I'll notice the light change. I'm like, oh, okay, that light's no good now. Let's go to this. Right, and you don't keep trying to make it work just because you already have the equipment out and it's comfortable and you've been getting great shots. It's like, no, you realize the lights change and now it's time to make a change. And I choose optimal. What's my optimal choice right now? Yeah, and you know, sometimes it it, it does take time. You have to stop. You have to put whatever away and, and open up new equipment. But taking that time, it's so worth it. It is, and the other thing I'll say along those lines is... If you're good at what you do, and I hope photographers are listening to this, if you're good at what you do, you're anticipating that change. Because if you know, and Emily will tell you, I'll look right at the sun and I'll tell her, I'm like, yeah, we got 10 minutes. Right. We got 15 minutes. And that's just, guys, that's thousands of shoots talking. And I'll just look at it. And when people say, oh, well, you can, oh, that's no big deal. You can just look at sunset. Guys, I'm telling you, if you're going to rely upon little apps for your sunset and sunrise, it ain't going to work. I mean, it, it cracks me up because sometimes. Are you in the mountains? Are you not? Precisely. I have people, I have people that works up like, oh, well, sunset's at 530. I see, see that mountain over there? <laughs> it's going to change that, that, that parameter just a little bit. We got like 15 minutes less thanks to that mountain that's going to block the sun. And so um, it really is get you guys getting down and understanding those things. And that is those things come as the result of a lot of shooting. And so if you want to capture magic hour, just like if you want to capture sunrise, sunset, whatever it may be, you have to know it's going to happen ahead of time and start setting up for it at that point. We start with some crazy lenses, the, the Canon 200 millimeter 1.8, uh, mm-hmm. shot with the A7R3, shot with a 35 Zeiss, the 50 Zeiss, I mean, we really went through, and Rotolite will be happy because we have production shots of one of the AOSs. We stuck it in the toilet of the... Uh, <laughs> of the little shed. Of the little... It wasn't a shed. It was actually a bathroom from the 1950s, back when the Salton Sea used to be, you know... Thriving. Thriving. But, um, but yeah, and, and so he, Barry was saying, wow, just watching you just go through all those different lighting scenarios. And... I think what surprised the group was, 
and I had to learn this over the years, was if you find a location that rocks, exhaust it. Mm-hmm. And just slowing down. People are so quick to like pack up, up and leave, find somewhere else. Like like you were saying, exhaust that location. Shoot it and do do a do a three sixty. Go all the way around it. And we did. Oh yeah. We put rotolites. Oh, we put a rotolite. She had the most beautiful headpiece I've ever seen. Thank you. And she gosh, she you're so creative. It's it's ridiculous just how talented you are, by the way. Thank you. But you bring it out in me. You let me feel comfortable being weird <laughs> that's good i guess you gotta be Ma- weird make, to- yeah making weird things trying new things creating art i'm glad you brought that up because that's something we talk about too in the workshop is we tell people to find a creative um your yin and yang so she's my yang and i'm the yin and finding that that yang yang finding that <laughs> sorry finding that creative counterpart and uh you know I, i've shot some wonderfully talented people over the years, but she really is my first muse. And the reason that it works so well is because you, um, for as much as you say, hey, Jason, you let me be weird, I can't, there's nothing, I don't, I, I could tell Emily to do anything and she'd do it. And that's freeing for me as an artist because I'm like, hey, I can ask her to do this and she's not going to be like, oh, I don't want to do that. Like stand on this pole <laughs> what was that thing that was sticking out of the that ground column yeah that little column that's not level um slanting a little bit to the side <laughs> stand on it stick your leg out get on your toe i'm like okay let's try it <laughs> i always do tell her if you don't feel safe it's okay totally totally but it's just, just giving an example of something you know you're like hey can you stand up on there you feel comfortable totally yeah for sure and I think that that's, that's what's important is understanding that. And so it goes both ways. And so like when she comes to me with outfits and she's showing me stuff, um, it's really neat because I can sit there and say, hey, that that's fantastic. And she's like, is this too weird? And I'm like, no, let's go for it. Yeah. Let's have a great time. And uh, I'm happy to say that we just, we've, I've only posted one shot from that shoot on day two. And that's so far the most <sighs> liked image I've ever had for uh, anything other than my eclipse shots. Which people like just because they like astronomy, but for Jason, that shoe is so breathtaking, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not I, like just like it, looking at those images. They're they're beautiful. They're ridiculous. It's it's fantastic work. <laughs> I'm really proud of it. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> I mean, and I know you guys listen to me. Oh, they're so cocky. No, no it's no, 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 no. It's gratifying. Yeah. It's gratifying because you know how much work we put into making this stuff happen? I'm proud of us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so um, that that shoot's just remarkable. And and what we're trying to do, guys, is not show, to, oh, we're so great. No, no, no. No, I encourage you that you can do it too. Precisely. And it's, and it's not too difficult. It's doable. There's a couple things that go into play. you got to be creative. Okay. You got to have the creative vision because that that that's a struggle for some people. But after that, if you here's what I've said to people countless times: if you have the talent quotient, the rest is all about hustle, persistence. It's all about hustle. Like don't don't ha- don't do something. I don't have a just G rate. Don't half ass it. <laughs> <laughs> don't half ass it, guys. If you're gonna do it, do it. Yeah, do it right. Yeah, think about your story. What what are you what picture? Like what image are you trying to portray? What what's the purpose? Yeah. Find all the props that can help support that vision. Don't just, you know, do it a little bit. Really go all in. Yeah, totally. And if you think about it, that outfit idea and and again, if you're go to jasonlearn.com slash podcast to see the pictures and or you're watching them now on the video, but the creation of that wardrobe was over the course of many, 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 many days. Now, it wasn't that Emily spent 10 hours a day on that one thing, but it that's I think what that's the beauty of it is she would work on it, go away, work on it, go away, yes. work on it, go away. And then that gives you time it to think. It was fresh. Every day I wasn't worn out by working on it 12 hours a day. It's like, you know, put a little effort. Go do something else. Yeah. And then that also gives Let you... Let it dry. <laughs> you know? Totally. And that also gives your your brain the time to kind of come back to it and say, hey, you know what? I've kind of shifted a little bit or and or I'm going to go a little bit further mm-hmm. with what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. 
And so with this with this whole outfit, what was really what was really fun is the day of the shoot. You know, she'll come and show me things, or and or the night before, and we'll look at it. And we'll say, hey, let's do this. Let's like, try this. What, yeah. What what else do we need? You know, the sprinkles and cherry on top. What else can we add? And so we'll stand. Like I'll put it on, and he'll look at it, and together we came up with, hey, how about we glue some flowers on the legs? So you know, moments before the shoot. No, that was the night before. I was glue gluing some flowers on the legs had a few extra flowers and right before we went out the the very next day i glued it right onto my shirt like you know five minutes before we got into the car totally those last minute things were like oh let's just add that and speaking of that that organic nature that we like to bring to the shoots tying things in together you know we get out there to the shoot location and uh we had a big, huge, well, not a big, huge, a jar of Vaseline, and we used it as a sticky, we used it as adhesive. Yeah. And so I got Vaseline with a, with a little paintbrush. Because you have to be resourceful. Like, we're always out on the road, work with what you have. So we're like, hey, here's some Vaseline. Yeah, so I, I got the Vaseline with a little paintbrush, started to paint it on her arms, legs, and just putting the Vaseline on, and then I grabbed the white sand from the salt and sea crumbled it up and I just literally started throwing it yeah on my headpiece to texturize and to connect her yeah like my outfit was you know I I had just put everything together so it's still clean it's it looks new we need to, to dirty it up a little bit so I fit the environment yeah and that's exactly what we did Amy is so fun she'll always say to me Jason tell me a story tell me a story and so I have to be a, I have to, it, I feel like a dad. It's like I have to constantly create stories <laughs> and just tell a story. But and that puts my mind in the right place. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll make, I'll just make it up. And I can tell when I've hit pay dirt with her because her, she, I can see, I can hear, I can feel her buy-in when I found the right storyline. And she changes and she moves and she emotes differently once I've connected her to that storyline. One of my favorite things that you shared, thank you for that. One of my favorite things that you say about photographers needing to do, and you do it so well, is bringing out the happiness and joy and buy-in to the shooting scenario from the inside, bringing it out from the inside. You can see it in their eyes. And you do that so well. Because I can feel it too. I, it's Even though I can't see it, I can feel when my eyes are... Like when, when they're when lit up. Alive. Yeah, yeah. When I come alive, when I've hit that buy-in point. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about us doing this podcast together is if you're a photographer listening to this, I can't say this strongly enough. If you can get your head into their perspective, it will change the way you shoot and it'll change what you bring out of them and make it 10 times better. I promise you that. But just just thinking, oh, this is kind of my show, my thing, my this, my that. I know I'm the boss. I know all that. It doesn't matter. I've completely brought her in for a complete co-collaboration. And 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 I think you would say that I – would you say that I do that with you? It's I don't – Oh, absolutely. I don't, like, try to be a boss to you. I no, try to – No, no, you – I come up with ideas and, and you – you usually listen to the majority of my ideas. Well, usually she'll come up to me with my idea, and, and I we understand. Expand from it. Yeah, she'll come up to me with an idea, and I know when she's coming to me, it's like I need you to uh, emotionally, financially, and artistically get my back on this, support me on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I understand that's a three pronged approach. I'm like, I'm gonna have to pay for it. I'm going to have to devote logistics and time to shooting it. And artistically, I have to buy into it. I have to buy into it. Yeah, because if he's not sold on it, then I can feel that too. If you're not thrilled <laughs> totally. and you don't love it, now I'm going to feel self-conscious about this crazy thing that's on my head or whatever, you know? <laughs> you're absolutely right. And that's why it, it, it requires that mutual buy-in. And so <laughs> what you're watching is we, we come up with ideas. We'll talk about a location that we're going to want to shoot. She'll start sh sending me ideas, texting me uh, pictures, all sorts of stuff. And before you know it, we're creating a collaboration and 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 what we're really advocating to the world of photography and 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 i i really want this to come through in this podcast this is the charge and the mission statement for us 
we are not accepting it from ourselves. So it's, you know, Emily, for, for uh, let's just be candid. You're obviously attractive. Thank you. You have a nice shirt on right now. It's not revealing or anything, but it's a pretty shirt. Just like a flannel. Right. Yeah, we could kill a shoot out here. <laughs> that, that's a, that's, <laughs> we could kill a shoot out here right now. Yeah, let's go crush it. Right? <laughs> no. And I, I could pull out my flash. I could set it up, shoot it at 1.4. It'd be great. It would be an eight. <laughs> <laughs> and. But Joshua Tree is worth more than a, a maroon flannel and a, you know, yeah, a no, maroon shirt. Yeah, no maroon fives <laughs> around here. Yeah, for reals. And one thing that, one thing that, I think that we really want to communicate to the photography world is challenge yourself to be more because <laughs> we challenge ourselves to be more. We really do. You know, that one of the things they say about people who lose weight, they'll say the last 20 pounds are the hardest pounds to lose. And I said that when it comes to creativity and in your growth as a photographer, it is really easy to go from one to seven pretty quickly. Going from that seven to a 10, that eight to a 10, that is significantly more difficult because that's where you have to elevate your photography and you have to really delve into learning all of the lenses, all of the laws of compression and bokeh and lighting, diffusion, reflection, diffusion plus flash plus, ref plus reflection, all of these different things, posing, styling, connection, communication. There are just, guys... That right. 7 to 10 is the leap. And that 7 to 10, if you're listening to this, you have to have an honest conversation with yourself and ask yourself, where am I? And please let me convey this as well. Don't fool yourself into your one best shot that that determines who you are. What determines who you are is your level of consistency. Are you delivering 10s on the regular or are you delivering 7s and 6s and once in a while you hit a 9? You know what I mean? And and that's the mark of a master. And they brought that up at the workshop. One of the guys, Dennis, said to, to us, it's very nice. He says, man, you guys are just crushing the work so bad, so great right now. How do you up it? And I made the comment to him. I said, you know, if you think about, and I'm not saying we're Steven Spielberg. I'm not saying that. And I, I said to him, I said, well, when you watch a Spielberg movie, are you asking did he... Like when you're talking about somebody at the top of the game, did he, wow, did he get it better every time? Or, or is he meeting his standards? Because his standards are so high. Is he meeting his standards? And they thought about it. They're like, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that's the goal is to achieve a very high level of success. And then boom, just boom, boom, boom. Your, 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 your shots, your movies, your everything, they're coming out at that level. And you're not letting yourself just settle. Uh, we, the last day of the workshop is all about the attendees, the attendee shot. They put everything that they learned, you know, the, the combination of the styling, the lighting, you know, what to use what at certain times of day. Um, they combined all a wardrobe. They combined all of that together to create their own awesome shoot. I, I got three models and uh, we set them up at different locations you know, different little stations and the attendees had timed intervals to work with them. And they were, they were large time chunks. They were. And the model to attendee ratio too was like two, two one to model, one. one model for every two attendees. It yeah, was wild. Two to one. So <laughs> the way the sun was hitting the sun, it was about Ugh. two o'clock. The way the sun was hitting the water, it brought all of the beautiful gold. Now I'm just, it's probably Agent Orange, which is why it was gold. <laughs> but it uh, brought out this beautiful gold in the water. And so the attendee said, hey, Jason, what would you do with this? And even though I wasn't going to shoot that day, I, I shot for about 30 minutes to show them and then help them get shots. And so what we did was set up two 600 watt second monolights, one on the left, one on the right, to really fire 1200 watts back into the model undiffused that's how bright it was out there undiffused 1200 watts back at the model um yeah it was bright reflecting off the water too it was, it was wild it was so still it was amazing it's something like i've never seen yeah it was wild and so i shot so i turned to emily and i gave her the look and she's like Ugh, you're gonna go make me get it <laughs> aren't you and i said yeah I set up one of the other models, Daisy, to shoot, started shooting her and got things set up because I really wanted to show the attendees this is a very complex lighting scenario and I want to show you how to tackle it. So once we got set up, 
um, uh, I showed the attendees what to do, and the attendees were able to get some fantastic shots of her. Mm-hmm. Really fantastic shots. In the meanwhile, Emily, you know, flash flash Emily over here. She runs back to the place, drives <laughs> back. She's back in like three minutes in a different outfit and everything. And I'm like, what the freak? And so she, she, she comes on back and then we shoot her. And then that was hilarious because we were <laughs> knee deep in dinosaur diarrhea. Ugh. It was absolutely putrid and disgusting, guys. And I'm complaining, but poor Miss Emily's out there further than any of us it was nasty nasty further out further out than the previous model and further than any photographer but i'm standing there and i get stuck i'm about to my knees and in, in this diarrhea dinosaur stuff and then <laughs> man down man bam man down i go down i land my camera's up here and squish it's total squish <laughs> and and it's disgustingly wet and so within about Honest car keys, I'm like, oh, you don't get to replace one key fob, you can replace six. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Emmy. <laughs> He's like, yeah, someone take my keys. <laughs> yes, I threw the keys to my man Kevin. And uh, by the way, he did a great job on production shots too. But yes, thank you, Kevin. But uh, did uh, did that, and then um, then one of the volunteers, Mike, came over, and the funniest thing was he was trying to get me up. And he would, and he was grunting and groaning and grunting and groaning and grunting and groaning. So, in such a funny way that as I'm trying to get myself, ex- <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to extricate myself, and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> we have all this on video, and I'm, I'm trying. And to- as one person's coming out, the next person's getting stuck. Yeah, it's it was like, like it, a pulley effect or domino. Yeah, effect. pardon the pun. It really was a crap show, but <laughs> it really was. Everybody's falling down. It, it ended up being a a tremendous experience and if we hope you take something away from this um i hope you take away the creative spirit that emily and i have created between each other and that collaboration and your ability to um go out and create truly go out and create and do something special and, and you guys can get out there and do it too absolutely that's what we want to encourage so if you want to join us guys you can come to workshop slash 2019 or jasonlinner.com slash register. You can follow this beautiful, very talented woman over to my left at em.explores. On Instagram. On IG. And you can follow me at jasonlinner photography on Instagram. And you guys can just Google my name and you know find all that other crap. But Freaker McGee. Freaker McGee, yeah. Dot net. Fedora bastard, all <laughs> those stuff. <laughs> but we love you guys. We're so excited. Uh, you know, we found a bunch of people. There was a creepy man at the Salton Sea. We had to tell him we were going to, we wondered if he was part he of the was FBI. So creepy. One of Illuminati. the attendees kept asking him, uh, where are you from? Up north. Yeah, but where? Up north. Yeah, but where? Up north. Like, like could up, be, up north. Just could be anywhere. He's like, are you Santa? <laughs> yeah, I asked him if he was Santa Claus and he was really weird. Yeah, he was creepy. But. Creeper McGee. Thank you. Thank you for listening, guys. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Spreaker. Mother Freaker. <laughs> <laughs> you can find it all over the place. You guys can find some really cool stuff. And uh, thank you for listening and watching. We really appreciate it more than you know. So until next time. Keep shooting. Never give up on your dreams. Find the right gear that works for you. And remember. And remember, you only have one chance, Mother Freakers, to get it right. We'll talk to you guys later. So get it right, guys. Peace. Peace.